Good morning, members of parliament, support staff, visitors in the public tribune, radio listeners, and those following by various forms of media. Welcome to the continuation of this urgent public meeting number 21 of the parliamentary year 2021-2022 of today, Wednesday, December 14th, 2022. I would like to give a special welcome to the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, Ms. Sylvia Silveria Jacobs, and her support staff and representatives from GEBE. We will establish a quorum of nine members. Please stand for a moment of silence. I have received notice of absence from the following members, MP Emmanuel, MP Bijlani, and MP Marlin, and we've also received notification of lateness from MP Peterson and MP Rumu. Are there any notifications from the floor at this time? Thank, uh, MP Pantaflet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to the Chair, my colleagues in Parliament, Honorary Prime Minister and her support staff, MP, persons that are viewing and listening. Chairman, it's just a little um, advice to the public. Um, when you're coming out of course, you less, there's a sign saying that you cannot make a left. And I realize, Mr. Chairman, that very often persons are doing so. I've seen a couple of times where persons almost got into accident because why? The person coming down, going into town, doesn't expect that person to come out in that direction. So I'm advising the road users to please follow the road signs and not make the left turn where the sign states clearly that you're not allowed to make a left turn. Another matter, Mr. Chairman, also has to do with the season that we are in. Um, unfortunately, the persons who are throwing their old washing machine and, and all uh, uh, the, the furniture in what we would term the bush, you know? And I'm saying, Mr. Chairman, you know, you, 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 you're blaming government for keeping the road clean, keeping the area clean and so on. But I believe as, as citizens, we have a civic duty also to, I mean, be part of keeping our island clean. So I just had to make this plain and, and, and order, and I hope that, Mr. Chairman, you don't take it in the wrong because the fact is, it is everybody's business to abide by the rules of traffic and also everybody's business to keep the island clean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Pantaflet. I see no other need for, yes, we have one more notification. MP Grisha Heilega Martin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to the Prime Minister and his support staff. Good morning to my fellow colleagues and good morning to those listening and viewing today. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for the Prime Minister before this meeting begins, if possible, if she could please elucidate a bit on it. It's regarding the apology that's going to be um, presented to the country on Monday. I'd like to ask the Prime Minister when this apology is presented to us on Monday, if the Prime Minister will be consulting with the people before accepting the apology, yes or no. Just my question, it's very important that we understand what the Prime Minister's take is on this apology. We don't know what it entails, we don't know what's exactly it's going to, what exactly is going to be said, but will the Prime Minister consult with the people before accepting this apology. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Heiliger Martin. Any other notifications? That not being the case, thank you, members of parliament, for those notifications. We have as agenda point for this public meeting, recent developments that impact the liquidity of the utility company and the ability of NVGEBE to continue as a going concern. This is IS 1189 of the 2021-2022 parliamentary year, dated August 15th, 2022. We'll go over to the agenda point. On August 15th, 2022, Parliament received a letter from MPs De Weaver, Gums, Westcott Williams, and Emmanuel with the request that an urgent public meeting of Parliament be convened with the above-mentioned agenda point. The presence of the Prime Minister and Minister of Public Housing, Spatial Planning, Environment, and Infrastructure, Vromi, was also requested for this meeting. This document is registered as incoming document IS 1189 of the 2021-2022 year and can be found on the P drive of Parliament. This meeting was convened on August 24th, 2022, during which after the Prime Minister gave her opening remarks, three speakers on the speakers list, namely MPs Westcott Williams, Gums, and Emmanuel, posed the questions to the Prime Minister. The meeting was adjourned at 1236 
to allow the Prime Minister to attend a previous appointment. The Speaker's list remained open for other members who wished to speak on this agenda point. On August 26, the meeting was reconvened, during which other members of Parliament were added to the Speaker's list, namely Duncan, De Weaver, Ramu, Pantaflet, Bryson, Peterson, and Richardson. Upon request of the Prime Minister, the meeting was then adjourned to allow the Prime Minister time to indicate how long it would take to answer the questions posed in the first round. The meeting was reconvened for some remarks and a PowerPoint presentation by the Prime Minister that gave an outline of NVGEBE. This PowerPoint presentation is booked at Parliament on the incoming document IS 1420, August 26, 2022. After the PowerPoint presentation, the meeting was then adjourned to allow the Prime Minister time to prepare the answers to the questions posed by members in the first round. The meeting was again reconvened on September 2nd, during which the Prime Minister provided some of the answers to the questions posed by the members of Parliament in the first round, and the MPs Westcott Williams, Gums, and De Weaver posed clarification questions to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister then answered some of the clarification questions. The meeting was then adjourned to allow the Prime Minister time to receive the answers to the remaining questions and the clarifications questions posed by members of Parliament in the first round. The meeting was reconvened on October 14th, 2022, during which the Prime Minister provided answers to the questions posed by members of Parliament in the first round, and members of Parliament posed additional questions then in the second round. The meeting was uh, once again adjourned to allow the Minister time to prepare the answers to the questions posed by the members of parliament. Members of parliament today, the Honorable Prime Minister, Ms. Silveria Jacob, is present to provide the answers posed by members of parliament in the second round. I will now give the floor to the Honorable Prime Minister, Silveria. Mr. Silveri Chairman, if I may please, before you continue, a po yeah, proposal of order. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and a good morning to you. A good morning to the Prime Minister and her entourage, the representatives of NVGB, and of course a good morning to my colleagues and all persons tuned in to this meeting. Mr. Chairman, you so adequately outlined the process of this meeting from its start to where we are today. Mr. Chairman, if you summarize it, that would mean that this meeting requested Four months ago, the last session was two months ago, and we're now hearing the final answers to clarifications. My proposal of order, therefore, Mr. Chairman, is that the speakers on this agenda point be allowed the opportunity, whether it is to be considered another round of speaking but for those members who are part of the speaker's list, that these be given the opportunity following the clarifications provided by the Prime Minister to address the matter once again is my proposal of order. In other words, that we are allowed to react to not only what has happened since the last meeting, but also some of the answers provided. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, MP Westcott Williams. Uh, can you please repeat uh, just briefly your proposal? Surely, thank you once again, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I propose that the members who have spoken on this agenda point during the different sessions of the meeting be granted, if they so desire, the opportunity to speak to the topic of GEBE again following the clarifications. In other words, do not close the deliberations on the matter of GEB following the clarifications to be provided by the Prime Minister, but rather, again, for those members who have spoken and wish to do so, to have the opportunity to address the matter once again. And if the issue of time is, is, is a concern, my proposal would be that we be granted at least five extra minutes to address this topic given the sequence of events of this meeting and this meeting topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. I will adjourn until 9.40 to, uh, I will get for the support. I just want to have a technical discussion with the Khifir and then I will go back to the proposal and check for support. Uh, we'll just, a three minute adjournment.
<clears throat> Good morning once again, members of Parliament. I took that adjournment, as I mentioned before, adjourning to have a technical discussion with the Secretary General on the handling of that proposal before actually even um, going to the members regarding uh, seconding the proposal to make sure that the proposal is something that can, can uh, be proposed. It is indeed so. Uh, is there any others who would second the proposal? That works. Hands. <laughs> huh? Well, uh, as I said in faction leaders, for the record, it's good if it's, if it's I recorded. I second it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very I good. second it too, Mr. Chairman. There we go. Thank you, MPs. Um, the proposal is to effectively, if to summarize it, is to add another round um, to the deliberation. We will have a, a list prepared of the names of those that have signed in. Just for the edification of the public, we're actually at the end of the second round. Uh, customarily in public meetings, we always have uh, two rounds of deliberations, but there was a proposal to add another one. Uh, the Prime Minister also did indicate that she would give the elucidations a general update as well in addition to her questions. So just for everyone to know that that is something that the Prime Minister will be willing to provide regardless of this proposal. We will now... Kifir, you will uh, read out the names. So you're voting for the proposal, which is for to add the other round or against uh, adding the other round. We will need to adjourn for two minutes to get our number box. Meeting adjourned. Welcome back, members of parliament and those viewing. I will select the number, and we will begin at number seven. I apologize, I actually did not ask if there's a need for roll call. Yes, roll call. So now we will pick the number again. Three. MP Chanel Brownville. Four. MP Solange Duncan. Four. MP Melissa Gums. Four. MP Grisha Heidegger Martin. Four. MP George Pontefleck. Against. MP Hyacinth Richardson. Against. MP Romina De Weaver. Four. MP Sarah Rascal Williams. Four. MP Akeem Arundel. Against. Vice Chairman Rolando Bryson. Against. The 
Proposal is voted for 5-5 five, five, and therefore is not, does not have a majority support for that proposal. Therefore, members of parliament, uh, we will now continue with the meeting and Prime Minister, um, as you indicated, how, how, despite the fact that proposal did not carry, you will answer the questions, but you will make some general remarks to update about the current situation of GEBE as well, correct? Prime Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you. Good morning to the Christie and the Honorable Members of Parliament. Good morning to the other Secretaries General of Parliament and support staff of the Ministry, the Government, as well as the Special Representative and Temporary Manager, Mr. Troy Washington of NVGEBE. Good morning to the people of St. Martin tune in via the various media. And a season's greetings to one and all. Mr. Chairman, before I start, I'd like to also convey, I know that there are persons going through many challenges um, and the passing of a officer from the justice chain also was brought to my attention. My condolences to the family, all of you who are going through any type of bereavement at this time. And I've had also some qu uh, queries over the weekend with challenges, persons, family members who are challenged with family with mental health challenges. I think we've brought a lot of awareness to the public over the past few months, but indeed we continue to struggle to be able to ensure that all get the timely assistance they need. Thankfully, when I was updated though, the family was able to get some assistance and uh, I continue to pray for strength in this regard for all who are going through their various challenges. Mr. Chairman, also before going into the answering of the questions, a question from the MP, Helga Martin, regarding the much talked about apology for slavery past that is being planned by the Dutch government. I have checked with the Secretary General of the Council of Ministers. We have responded after the first visit on September 6th in writing as a government asking several questions uh, in a letter dated the 28th. Can you confirm whether that letter was sent to Parliament as well? Uh, Prime Minister, it has been received by Parliament, but uh, is in the process of being... The one from the 28th. Which one did we... We, we just received from the Secretary General an email. I don't know if that's the one you're referring so to. So that one was sent before. So that one should be with Parliament. If okay. you haven't received it, notify and uh, we'll okay. ensure that that is sent. Before you finish answering your questions, the review will check and then I'll be able to update the members of Parliament about those letters. Right. And I've just asked uh, our Secretary General to provide the one that was sent on the 12th, which is a few days ago. Um, provide me, if possible, briefly to summarize what has happened thus far. So I think everyone knows that they, uh, the government requested to come and hear the different uh, countries, which they did on the 6th of uh, September. We heard them or they wanted to hear our sentiments. It wasn't necessarily a consultation as you would expect in this type of a case. Uh, they've received the report. They want to provide an answer to their parliament, but felt the need to come and hear the countries, the, former colonies, or some might say even still colonies within the Caribbean. Uh, they visited Suriname, St. Martin, Curacao, St. Eustatius, I believe. Um, those discussions, we also had a cultural manifestation where several groups were able to make statements through speeches, poetry, song, dance, whatever it may be, in the hills where we celebrated Emancipation Day. That was also on the 6th. Uh, what I can say, in, uh, if I use the Dutch, they appear to be under the indruk of how it feels from this side. I think they've been hearing a lot from the diaspora in the Netherlands. They have been quite active over the past few years. However, for St. Martin, it is not something that we have had a dialogue group deliberate on, had any discussions or deliberations in Parliament, etc. So we respectfully inform the government via that letter of the 28th that this cannot be considered a true consultation 
and that we need more information and we need opportunity as a country to do what I just mentioned. The second letter is a little more explicit in that regard as since then there were also a cuts hoist discussion in Curacao where several, two members of our community participated. They invited community members to participate, not government, and they also are drawing conclusions from those discussions, so different grassroots groups from the various uh, Caribbean countries were invited, all six had discussions then. That was prior, what date was that? Right, that was on the 23rd, after the State Secretary had been here on the 21st. In those discussions, State Secretary continues to state that uh, this is just the beginning and no conclusions can be drawn in what is being drawn. Uh, she's seen the reluctance of St. Martin and other groups throughout the kingdom who are a little concerned with the haste with which this apology is being proposed. And I, as well as many others, explicitly explained to the State Secretary and others who have asked several other politicians uh, that St. Martin particularly needs the opportunity to deliberate on this, assess, go through the 10-point CARICOM um, action plan for reparatory justice, get all of the research needed before a stance can be taken, and that remains our stance today. So the Dutch government feels that they, it's an opportune time, they have the momentum moving now, this is something that has been long awaited and they want to make their apology now. Up to the last discussion, and you can read from the letter, there are several questions still being asked by the government of St. Martin. We are in the process of uh, establishing a advisory committee on slavery atonement and reparations for St. Martin. And that group will be tasked to gather the information, be able to have the deliberations within the community um, and once the apology is given, when that happens, to take that along in its deliberations to advise government, come to parliament and have deliberations, and that is basically what is being done at this moment. So a, uh, the apology is to be given by, from what we gather, and a lot, M Madam, Mr. Chairman, members of parliament, I think it's, it's good that that question was asked here. A lot is being said but not a lot is documented. I forgot to mention one other deliberation that took place at the, on the 8th of December. I believe several members were in the Netherlands. I don't know if they were in that meeting as well, the Kutzhuis discussion on the 8th of December. And um, out of that, a report is being drawn up as well. The plenipotentiary minister was there at that meeting and updated us, and I've seen the draft document, uh, but officially it hasn't been really received by the government as well. So those persons which were representatives of governments, ambassadors, etc., deliberated over a day, broke out into smaller groups, came back together, and they are preparing a document to submit to the Dutch government to take along in preparing their apology. Um, I believe some other countries also are submitting things to be included in the apology. For me, um, we will be awaiting what that apology is. It's being planned for the 19th. The Prime Minister will issue it in the Netherlands and have representatives throughout the countries for further deliberations with interested parties. And um, we're awaiting response to our last letter of the 12th of December before any further discussion is made as to what type of participation will be there, but we've made it clear that no acceptance will take place until our advisory committee has been able to deliberate. We've had discussions as a country before, and, and we don't, uh, how you say? We would find it disrespectful if a timeline is put on that, especially seeing that we didn't have that advisory committee in place prior and our participation from day one was not there and many of the other countries. So I'm hoping that that is clear to all and it will definitely involve discussions at this level as well once the dialogue um, has started with the advisory committee.
to go back to the meeting. Prime Minister, which, yes? just uh, to elucidate on that point or to confirm, uh, the letter of September 28th was indeed received is under IS 045, and the letter that has been sent today is currently being booked in for members of parliament, the letter that was being referred to by the prime minister. Prime minister, you can continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, we return December 14th to reconvene urgent public meeting number 21 to finalize questions that were posed in a second round by the honorable members of parliament and which would to allow government and NVGB to collect answers. Mr. Chairman, through you to the honorable members of parliament, since last being here, there has been some progress as it relates to the appointment of two additional members to the supervisory board of directors, namely Mr. Charles Worth Sydney, Sydney and Mr. Dennis Richardson. Additionally, the crisis investigation has been effective with bi-weekly updates being provided to the Council of Ministers slash shareholder. The last uh, update would have been submitted last week, Friday. We've given them until an extension until this Friday to provide that one, and that would be six uh, reports. Uh, I believe a question was asked on that, so I'll leave that for, for what it is. Um, also, in our recent meeting, update meeting with the supervisory board management and um, certain members of the crisis team, I believe, were also in attendance. We received an update as to <clears throat> the current status of NVGEBE in that final reports. Some reports have been, the baseline study has been finalized. The HR study or report is finalized, but several are still being finalized, the ICT as well as the audit is being finalized and should be done before the end of the year. Based on these uh, reports, the management and advisors, supervisory board is devising a strategy on the best way forward. They are in fact already implemented strategies to increase collections, etc. The Situation with Seoul has improved in the sense of uh, being up to date with payments, et cetera. They're in negotiations and discussions for the future. Um, as it re relates to Wartzilla, they have been able to remove a 75% down payment, which was required after all of the hoopla started and the discussions in the press. They have now reached an, uh, an agreement that that is no longer required, and they are also in a good or uh, let's say discussion and negotiation with them moving forward. The cash flow has been, let's say, increasing. There's been an uptick in payments over the last few weeks based on the strategy that they have employed. And in terms of how they will move forward, these reports that are still pending will form part of the planning of that moving forward. So that is the update I have for now. I'll ask the temporary manager in case I missed anything to jot any other notes that would be important to note for an update. But indeed, um, in answering the questions, I will be able to elucidate further how Parliament can continue to be updated with up information that government may receive in the interim once this meeting has been finalized. So the Supervisory Board of Directors has been asked to prepare summaries of these reports to share with the Honorable Members of Parliament for transparency in what has been shared with government. And when we say summaries, it's because, of course, some of the information may be uh, a bit sensitive and not to be made public. Allow me now, Mr. Chairman, to proceed with the responses as have been provided by NVGEBE and those by government. From MP Grisha Helga Martin, Wendy, oh, I think I answered that already. 
You just put eyes? The apology? Okay. I was like, huh? It was added to my documents, but I've already addressed that. Um, the question was from Westcott Williams. Special representative is added to the name of the interim temporary manager. What is the direct responsibility of Mr. Washington? The, Mr. Washington operates under the supervision of the supervisory board of directors and will facilitate the investigation and function as temporary manager responsible for operational activities related to running the company. As special res representative, his assignment will end with the appointment of a managing director. So there's a little more involvement of the supervisory board with such a representative than would be normally the case. More reporting needs to take place. To the crisis team, investigation team, what is the terms of reference, what period of time, what are they supposed to do, what are their deliverables. The crisis team was established to support the temporary manager slash special representative, and it is based on the scope of services, including support related to the legal and operations of the company. The deliverables include, along with managing the investigation team, preparing reports for the supervisory board of directors, restoring billing and collection, and conducting, conducting a baseline study and establishing a crisis budget. As I mentioned before, um, this team is finalizing its reports, uh, hopefully before the end of the month. And so once the plans moving forward have been shared with the shareholder, it will be determined uh, whether that crisis team's tenure will end then or whether what the way forward will be. So at this time, I can't say, but the idea is not for the crisis team to continue to function um, into perpetuity or until new management is established. So once we have received the reports, then based on the supervisory board of directors' um, advice to the shareholder, then discussions will be had as to the way forward. And we will be updating once that is done. So towards the end of December, we should have all the reports, or the GEB should have all the reports, supervisory board. So sometime within the month of January, the shareholder will be able to deliberate on said reports and on the way forward. Updates from the current management. Can the reports be shared? I already answered that question, so the summaries are forthcoming. What is the specific agreement that government entered into with grid market? What are the expected deliverables? Government has signed an MOU with grid market to support governments in realizing <clears throat> partnerships for St. Martin's Renewable Energy Transformation Roadmap. It is a collaborative effort to going towards that between General Affairs, TEAT, VROMI, and GEBE. Of course, uh, since the hack, GEBE's input was not what it should be as they were focused on their recovery. However, the temporary manager is now in direct consultation with Grid Market as well. I forgot to say that in the updates um, in terms of GB's role towards sustainable renewable energy transformation. And also with the NRPB, whereby there was some budget also to assist GEBE in that regard. The expected deliverables of that MOU are the roadmap specifically, and that roadmap is in three phases, 2022 to 2024, on shore utility scale, which would see renewable energy penetration of 25%. Second phase, 2024 to 2028, offshore utility scale, with renewable penetration of 88%, expected then, and 2830, with onshore and 2030 would be the year we would want to reach full um, transition with onshore distributed and biofuel production realizing 100% transition.
transition to renewable energy. The roadmap is in its final process, making its way through the government. I believe Legal Affairs had to give their last uh, review of it. But as I said, it goes through the Ministry of General Affairs, Teyat and Vromi. So it has taken, even for my um, part, a bit long to reach to my desk for the final sign-off, where then it will reach to the Council of Ministers. So hopefully within short, that will be the case. But I'm very pleased to say, and they are also um, the work group, uh, because I think I've said this in prior meetings, that the policy work group also includes the same players, and that they are also busy with the upgrade of the 2014 policy, which is necessary for us to transition to renewable energy. And GEBE is also fully cooperating in that regard. Corporate governance changes to be instituted on St. Martin. When is this legislation expected to be in Parliament? When are we going to be at the stage for corporate governance? What is the status of changes, amendments to come as it pertains to the government-owned companies? The implementation team with the support <coughs> sorry, of the Department of Legal Affairs and Legislation is finalizing the amendments to the national ordinance. Once, the once this is finalized, the Council of Ministers will deliberate on the draft, and then the legislative procedure will follow accordingly. This, the question as to when are we going to be at the stage for corporate governance, um, we are within the framework of the current civil code book. Which one? on the national ordinance, but in cases where the article of incorporation of any of the companies does not fit it, then we go to the book two of the civil code. Uh, so there is corporate governance being executed. We are just on a trajectory to ensure that it is improved or that it is set in um, legislation the way we would want to see it moving forward. And the question as to, I believe I answered the status questions. So the implementation team is also working on a corporate governance authority, which would be the success of the current corporate governance council. And the framework which the council of ministers are expected, is expected to receive by the end of December is expected and once this is received, a comprehensive update will be provided to the honorable members of parliament. Question six from MP Westcott. How do you designate certain tasks to reps? In the current, is it still the case that there's no longer shareholder reps? How does this take place for now for all co companies? Currently, the Council of Ministers would mandate as necessary. Uh, we have an agreement as such that the individuals are the points of contact. They bring proposals to the Council of Ministers and we move forward in that manner. So basically the same way they would function as reps. The discussion on reinstitution of shareholders reps via Lance Beslight is going to be further deliberated in our first quarterly meeting with His Excellency Governor Bailey in the first week of January. Thereafter, we can update on the way we will be going forward with this. Question seven, the MP asks in about the expansion of the support in Parliament, what basis this government has? Are the negotiations holding up the process? The coalition, this was a question asked back then, but I can affirm that indeed the discussions to expand the coalition, we did do so with two members. In the meantime, we know that two other members have resigned, but as such, we still retain an eight-seat majority here in Parliament, as I am sure the members of Parliament are aware of. 
We have senior relief hanging in the balance, has been suspended for how long? When will we have the financial position to reinstate this? Based on the outcomes of the various analysis, management is working on a realistic bare bones budget. So the budget that had been presented was deemed unrealistic and is being revamped for 2023, um, where serious cost cutting measures are being incorporated. We haven't had sight of such as yet. They expect that this budget will be finalized by the end of January 2023. And once this has been finalized, then the resumption of the senior relief initiative can take place. Is there any other investigation or other investigations taking place in GEBE other than the one that is being conducted by the investigative team? The Integrity Chamber has, on their own accord, established a an integrity investigation into GEBE on their own initiative based on Article 26 of their ordinance. The goal of their investigation is to determine if a lack of compliance to integrity related rules and procedures has led to misconduct or the current negative perception of the company. So that investigation is still ongoing. Or oh, it will start in January. So that's the only other investigation that we know of. The temporary manager I mentioned though did reach out to CAPASM to determine whether CAPASM slash OM to determine whether um, upon our request to ensure that GEB is cooperating with any investigation they would want to have. And based on the response we received from the OM was that at this point they see no need the, from when they close the case the last time, they see no need to proceed at this time. But they remain open and in contact with each other, sharing information up to, I believe, last week. When there was a scare, they were immediately called to assess the situation as well. So there is an open communication there, but no other investigations are ongoing. Review of the water agreement. What is the status of this agreement? Take or pay is being referred to. The water agreement as to the take or pay is the responsibility which falls under the Ministry of VSR. This agreement will expire in February 2025. The take or pay agreement is based on 20,000 cubic meters for six months, January, February, March, April, July, and December, and 17,000 cubic square meters cubic meters, sorry, for the other six months of the year, May, June, August, September, October, and November. NVGEB is working along with the Ministry of VSR on a business case related to the water agreement. So that is being worked on as well. Questions from MP Gums. Prime Minister, through you, through the chair, could you please explain why Minister of Finance and Minister of Vromi were the only ministers meeting with GEBE um, back in March and early April. I was able to go through documents back then, from back then, and saw the minutes of that first meeting. And uh, it was at the, as far as I can tell, at the government building, but seeing it was shortly after the attack, the attack was on what, the 16th? March 17th. This 25th was the week after. Uh, I believe they were called for an update. And at times when you cannot get the full council of ministers to get a ministerial meeting is held. And um, it was not necessarily a formal ministerial meeting, but minutes of said meeting were taken to gather information. And the minutes were shared with the council of ministers. So basically, it was initial meetings um, in terms of what happened, the same type of questions that were asked here in Parliament initially, the same types of questions that were asked subsequently when we had full Council of Ministers or shareholders meetings to get updates. Could Parliament receive the four-page letter that the Supervisory Board provided to government on 29th of March regarding the background information? and status of the attack. 
as mentioned by me in my remarks when we last had this meeting. Such a letter can be provided via the confidential route, Mr. Chairman. Have the proposed replacement supervisory board members been sent? As I mentioned in my opening statements, they have been in the meantime appointed. And yes, the CGC did render its advice. Is it the government's intention to, this time around, accept and adhere to the CGC's advice <laughs> regarding the supervisory board <clears throat> members for GEBE? The CGC's advice was adhered to as the intention to appoint the members were substantiated in line with the articles of incorporation. Collaboration, this, these questions come from the MP Emmanuel talking about a collaborative project between the police force and GB with the installation of cameras. I believe I answered that question in the first round or clarified it even. The MP talked about a broken water pipe. The situation was investigated. The leak was not related to NBGB's distribution network. I wasn't able to ascertain what building permit uh, the MP was asking about that was sitting on a minister's desk that did not allow for GEBE to install water and lights. Mr. Chairman, if possible, the Member of Parliament can be more specific and uh, submit such in writing for the Ministry of Rami to respond to. MP Duiva asks for the procedures executed by the consultant in 2020 at the request of the former IT head. So the procedures that were asked for was the information security policy, data recovery, user management, incident management, and backup procedure. These were received by management. MP Remo asked questions related to the internal audit department. Does NVGB have a functioning internal audit department? NVGB has an internal audit department as a part of the organization. The IAD is currently conducting reviews of policies and internal procedures at the request of the temporary manager. Is this internal audit department properly manned to carry out its core tasks in auditing the different aspects of the company? NVGB's IAD office is comprised of three persons, of which one is currently on voluntary leave. It should be noted that specialized audits, such as IT, require external support, as NVGB's internal audit department does not have the necessary expertise to execute such audits. Can you share what type of audits have been carried out thus far this year? Is it primarily financial audits, or is the audit department also engaged in operational audits, IT, et cetera. The annual inter internal audit plan was approved at the end of February, so this is pre-HAC 2022, and they were, is, sorry, the internal audit department was preparing to execute its first edit when NVGB experienced a cyber attack. Due to the interruption of NVGB's daily operations and bringing the system fully back up, executing the audits according to the approved plan was not possible. As a result, a revised plan was submitted, however, was placed on hold due to the ongoing workload of the departments that were scheduled to be audited. The internal audit department received two special assignments from management. Since then, assess what policies and procedures are in place and or should be in place at NVGEBE. Please know that this assignment is currently being executed. And the second, prepare a comprehensive company-wide risk assessment. So those are the two that they are currently working on. Did the internal audit department launch an investigation after the cyber attack? If yes, what were the findings? Why not? The internal audit department did not launch an investigation after the cyber attack because, as I mentioned before, cybersecurity investigation, investigations require specialized knowledge, qualification, and experience, which IAD at GEB does not have. 
IT audits are outsourced to external service providers specialized in cybersecurity and IT audits in general. The question on whether a whistleblower policy was in place at GEBE, uh, no, there is none. IT policy, as a result of the hack, does GB have a new and revised IT policy in place at the company? Is this policy based on any international cybersecurity frameworks and standards? If yes, can you outline key measures that can be shared publicly? For example, training and education of staff cybersecurity issues. The existing policies use and compliance were reviewed as part of the ICT infrastructure ev evaluation, which I mentioned before as one of the reports that is still in draft. Um, recommendations include hardening the ICT fabric of for NVGEBE, which requires updating the ICT policy. So indeed, policies were found. Um, the reports will then further elucidate on whether they were being carried out, et cetera, and uh, full recommendations will be made once the ICT audit is finalized, that report is finalized. Is GEBE utilizing any third-party vendors to strengthen its cybersecurity infrastructure? Indeed, NVGB, since AHAC has contacted, contracted a third-party vendor to provide cybersecurity management, database backup, disaster recovery, and 24-7 network monitoring. It is through this monitoring that they were able to ascertain that it was not a hack that took place last week. Does GEBE have a strategic plan in place for the company for the next three years? Although GEBE is the only player in its market, it does not omit the fact that the company requires strategic leadership and management to remain viable. As a result of the recent developments, sorry. what is management board doing to revise or amend the strategic plan? The crisis team has found various business and strategic plans that were, let's say, on the shelf. However, the status of the plans is unclear. The temporary manager and crisis team are developing a roadmap for digital transformation and will finalize the strategic plan once the reports, as mentioned in my opening statements, have been concluded and deliberations has taken place with NVGEB's supervisory board of directors. And what is the CFO's approach and strategy as it pertains to financial position of the company for this year moving forward, taking into consideration um, what has happened has any serious indication, has the CFO made any serious indication that the company is in dire financial trouble? For clarity, the company does not currently have a CFO. Uh, the crisis management team is in place under the leadership of Mr. Washington, and it starts with stabilizing the organization. Um, the initial step, of course, finances or financial experts form part of that team and are Sorry, the initial step was determining the company's cash position, liquidity, and monthly obligations. The situation is improving in terms of collections. Efforts remain underway to collect outstanding receivables and bring, bring clarity to all uh, users. There is still um, an amount of persons who have not um, or still are unclear about their bills. NVGEBE continues to urge the public to bring in their, if they have made payments that they are not seeing reflected in their invoices to ensure that they come in to clarify what is and is not, as a lot of inputs were done by hand, and all those that are being made via the bank are also being done by hand. So to ensure that everything has been inputted correctly, please bring your proof to NVGEB's customer service to get it regulated or send an email. There's a email address on the website where you can send in your concerns, queries, upload your receipts or your proof of payment through the bank so that these can be cross-referenced and updated within the system.
the MP further il uh, elaborated on a question regarding the budget and whether financing options are being sought as a result of the current financing financial situation. As I mentioned before, GB is um, adjusting the budget to be a bit more realistic and it will be as bare as possible to ensure that the ongoing necessities can be handled while we increase the revenues. The budget will be developed based on a financial model that addresses the results and recommendations derived from the assessments of the company's current state. So there, once the finalized reports, the audits have been finalized, then the budget will be reflecting what is recommended from those reports. What role has the audit committee of the supervisory board played in the recent matter of the hack and consequences that have unfolded? Have they launched any investigation as the relevant authority with the capacity to do so? That's at the supervisory board level. The internal audit department has, did not launch an investigation, as I mentioned before. But of course, an investigative team has been put in place to carry out the necessary audits which are ongoing. So not only on finances, but also on ITC, on HR, and a baseline study was carried out. The MP also acts under which C-level executive, the IT department falls. Um, under normal circumstances, that would fall under the CFO. But that position has been vacant since October 2020, so it will then fall fallen directly under whichever temporary manager that was there. Has the supervisory board of directors performed any performance evaluation on the C-level statutory directors from 21 and 20? Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get, we didn't get to answer for that one. Hmm? Um, there are two questions for the board, 13 and 14, which I'm still awaiting the responses for. If the member of parliament would allow, we would submit those in writing. But I can mention, based on the fact that the supervisory board has been expanded with the changes, that they continue to monitor and receive the, they are in constant contact with the temporary management at this point, so their supervi supervision has um, had to increase over the past few months since the temporary management special representative is in place. They are reported to bi-weekly in writing and also have to report to the shareholder. So they have indeed have to step up their supervisory role, uh, seeing that the situation with the crisis and investigation that we were in. So the supervisory board is actually awaiting the reports that are coming out of these various audits being made to make recommendations to the shareholder. So I think I'm still able to answer the question in that regard if I look at them now. Question 15, when was the last official audited financials of GEBE? Those were statements from financial year 2019. With upcoming audits, will instruction be given to the auditors to also take into account the hack? The auditors are currently working with the temporary manager and the crisis team to resume the audits of 2020 and 2021. However, it is already quite clear that the auditor will issue a disclaimer of opinion because of the severity of the impact of the financial data. On the payments, the MP asks, what is the management's approach to the issue with invoicing? There are so many complaints to date. What is management's plan of approach to the current situation, especially seeing that the company has indicated their intention to resume collection services? And VGBA is working towards the recovering of the billing system and related data, and this requires manual verification, as I mentioned before, to remove and correct errors. And VGB's approach has been to address clients when an existing payment arrangement, so that's been the focus over the last few weeks. 
people who and uh, institutions that had payment plans prior to the cyber event. Also, consumers have been asked to settle accounts. Reliable invoice remains the objective. Invoicing remains the objective of the recovery. And as I mentioned briefly earlier as well, NVGB requests that if customers have questions or concerns about their invoice, that they uh, contact GB immediately or visit customer services to rectify this. Um, several in our last presentation from them, even persons in the room, so ministers and or crisis team members um, explain the process that they also are experiencing. And so um, this has been resolved within a couple of days after having been visiting the offices and submitting the information. So that is proving to be an effective way to get your bill and your invoicing um, synchronized and reflecting the reality. What has been clarified is that the metering system uh, was never compromised, so your correct usage will be able to be reflected. It is now to ensure that the payments you've made are also reflected. And so if that isn't reflected in your current invoice, please do visit NVGB's offices or send an email to the relevant account. The MP further asks what, what government as shareholder, uh, if we intended to issue any instructions, such as an inquiry or audit, to be carried out. In fact, the crisis team being there as well as a special representative now is part of what the shareholder has done, and that is ongoing. The investigation is ongoing, hopefully to be finalized within short. MP Bryson asks, about the shareholders rep, and I think I clarified that in an earlier question from MP Westcott Williams. Um, the cyber BTP is part of Canto. Uh, he made a suggestion that the CERT, looking into the CERT, if possible, the minister Acting Minister of Teat will be looking into that. And the MP also asks if there's any role of the VDSM in investigating cybersecurity attacks, or are they assisting? Uh, the VSM, VDSM doesn't provide direct assistance, but they do highlight and identify risks and provide advice in that regard, which they did. MP Richardson asks, Concerning the claims department due to outages and destroyed appliances, or can government look into these matters? NVGB will investigate legitimate claims. However, the priority is currently to stabilize the company's ICT system, particularly to enhance the billing and invoicing so that the company can remain viable. However, anyone with claims should submit these and they will be handled as soon as possible. I believe that was the last question that we had on record, Mr. Chairman. A moment to confer with the temporary manager. Mr. Chairman, those are the last of the updates um, for now. And as I mentioned before, the uh, reports that have been submitted will be summarized. So we get that the last one this week for now, uh, before the final reports are issued, and um, they can, these will be summarized and forwarded to the members of parliament for further deliberations. Okay. Uh, Prime Minister, just to, just to clarify, um, as I had stated earlier, being, uh, I understand the reasoning behind the proposal, despite it did it pass. Um, you did touch on certain things that are still current. Is there anything generally you or any of your, your team would like to give an update on at, at this time? regarding the current status of GB? I did, in the opening statements, prior to answering, yeah. give an update on where we are, the updates we receive yeah. in terms of, it's still a challenge. Um, however, we are seeing, GBE is seeing an uptick in the collections. Um, specific numbers were given to us on Monday in the last update meeting. So as I mentioned, those reports can be submitted uh, okay. to the members of parliament. Um, but do know that hopefully with the finalization of the reports that are expected, 
um, a couple of them being final already and giving an indication of what needs to be done. So already the strategic planning on improving collection billing um, is being done. However, yes, and the fact that they are establishing a bare bones budget, that's also new information. So the budget that had been presented as per the deadline of October was not deemed to be uh, realistic for 2023. Um, they continue to increase in, so it's improving, but it's still not where it needs to be based on the fact that everything has to be done based on the system that is there by hand to correlate uh, the data that was with the data that is based on the data that was lost. So that remains a challenge and is being addressed or will be addressed in the recommendations from the various audits and reports that are expected by the end of the year. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Prime Minister. We've um, heard from the Prime Minister um, the answers to the questions that were posed in the second round as well as a general update. And now there will be an opportunity for clarification from members of parliament. If you can please indicate that you would like to speak, I see some hands and we will start with MP Westcott Williams. You have the floor. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the Prime Minister for the responses provided. Mr. Chairman, the issue of grid market and what the Prime Minister has explained with respect to this agreement, can the agreement be shared with Parliament? The agreement that now has led to a working understanding between several ministries, can that be shared? And if in sharing or before, the Prime Minister can indicate how grid market was selected to be the one to enter into an agreement with government to perform the corporation or exactly how the task of grid market is described. Mr. Chairman, I am happy to learn Although recent events do not really um, prove that to be exact the case, so I will ask the Prime Minister to share the agreement, which I have done, by the way, in writing before and received no response. But since in answering my question, the Prime Minister indicated that the, there is an agreement with at least eight members of Parliament, so if that agreement and any addition that it entails to the current governing program can be shared with Parliament, the agreement that it has been alluded to having been sent to His Excellency the Governor, if that particular agreement can be shared with members of Parliament. With respect to the temporary manager of GEBE, are all the lines of communication from and to the temporary manager being done um, via the supervisory board of directors. So um, it's a special representative or a special representative function. That's what it is. And so, um, but is all the correspondence with, in this case, Mr. Washington, is that via the supervisory board, or is there still a direct line that can be used from the shareholder to Mr. Washington and back? With respect to the OM report that the OM has indicated, for them the case is closed, to paraphrase the response given by the Prime Minister, and then my question is, based on the report that was submitted to COM, from the Public Prosecutor's Office, so the OM, did that lead to any specific actions by COM based on the report? And if so, which actions have the Council of Ministers undertaken based specifically on the report of the Public Prosecutor's Office? Did I understand the Prime Minister to say that the report by the Integrity Chamber 
is it finished? Is that report finished or is it still in progress? And if it is finished, what is the status? Has it been submitted to the government? And had the government also, um, did the government need to undertake any action? So in, in essence, I'm asking what exactly is the status of the Investi integrity investigation by the integrity chamber, which they took upon themselves to execute. Mr. Chairman, I think those are just a few clarifications and documentation that I have requested, I am requesting of the government via the Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Do we have any others for clarification? Yes, MP De Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for the answers, um, Prime Minister. By you, Mr. Chair, there's, uh, you know what, let me just get to the main one so, so I can get it out. Uh, when it comes to shareholder representative, um, there's been, you know, a lot of sort of uncertainty or grayness around it. So I just want to make sure that the Council of Ministers is collectively, as a whole, the shareholder representative for all of the government-owned companies. That's one, cl one clarification, because I don't go by hearsay and rumors. I want to know straight up that this is exactly unchanged since Council of Ministers takes collectively a decision on any government-owned company. Um, when it comes to now, I'm going to go back to the, to the beginning. Uh, the answer provided was that um, the crisis team is being effective. It's a very broad statement. So I just want to clearly, I would just, I want to just have a little bit comfort that the lines, the separation is very clear between the crisis management team, their core responsibilities, that it doesn't overlap when it comes to what the temporary manager is doing, the special representative, and then the rest of management. The reason I say that is because the Prime Minister mentioned that the crisis team is involved in restoring administration. If they have an oversight responsibility, that's what I want clarity on, because if they're involved in restoring the administration, restoring the administration is operational, that is usually left to the actual full-time employees that have been at GB all the time. Um, I'm very happy to hear that Wardsilla is being cooperative and they have no concerns. I'm very happy to hear that Seoul is regulated and they have no concerns. I want to remind everyone that when I came out publicly about GB and I said, I have a concern of GB, whether or not it can continue to operate as a going concern. That meant whether or not it can continue to operate for the foreseeable future with no, with no strange things happening, such as government proven to be a a guarantor and government having to supplement their income. So I have, while it's very, very general answers, I have a little bit of very, very little comfort, but it's going in the right direction. So where we should have been actually immediately after the hack is where we are now. I understand that, but I have to, I understand that, Mr. Chairman, but it is clarification and the clarification is on every answer I got from the Prime Minister. So when it comes down to and I don't appreciate you actually like throwing me off because I do have a bunch of questions. So if there's a time limit and clarification, then I let was, me know. I was preferring not to interrupt you verbally, just that you're giving quite an elucidation, because but I that you would come to the clarification. I have to back okay. it up because of where we are so that we can come full circle to where we are okay. today at the end of an emergency meeting of GB. So when it comes down now to crisis management team, temporary manager, all of that culmin culminates around an episode that happened in March and actually, decisions were made prior to March of new management. So what's going to happen to that? Because supplement, because actually after the hack, you have someone resign, you have people temporarily on leave. I just need to know what can we expect from it? Because since November 2020 was when we had last full, full, uh, full time, how do you say, permanent management. So full-time management, not temporary managers, not acting directors, all of that. I just need to know, can we, are we going to go into a third year of no management? That's what I want to know, Mr. Chair. I uh, think I, MP West got covered, the crisis managing, the, sorry, the grid market. For me, I see that the answer that was said was cash flow is increasing. There's an uptick in payments. And when, um, 
there was also a, the answer mentioned by the Prime Minister saying that we have strategies, there are strategies implemented by, uh, as of the current status of GB, strategies implemented to increase revenues. What strategies are those other than the regular uh, control, collection control, which is if you don't pay, we cut you. So I just want to know if there's anything extra other than if you don't pay, we cut you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, MP De Weaver. And MP De Weaver, just to confirm the Prime Minister, also I believe it was question 13, had asked you if uh, one of the questions related to the supervisory board evaluation, if you would be okay receiving that in writing. That is not a problem. Is it only coming to me or to uh, it, the it, entire parliament? It's coming to the entire parliament, okay. but being that it's your question, she's respectfully asking if she can Not a problem. To Thank you, parliament. Mr. Chair. I'm yeah. completely fine with that. Okay, great. Um, do we have any other clarifications? I, I see no need. Prime Minister, you have gotten clarifications from two members of parliament. Um, how would you like to proceed or do you want to indicate how much time you need? 10 minutes, we will adjourn until 11 a.m. Meeting adjourned.
<clears throat> Good morning, members of parliament, honorable prime minister, those viewing this meeting. We've been here for close now to the close of this meeting where we're deliberating matters surrounding GB, this urgent public meeting number 21. We've had the prime minister who has answered the questions and then we've received clarifications from the members of parliament, the Weaver and Westcott Williams. The prime minister is now prepared to answer those clarifications at this time. Prime minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, MP Westcott Williams asked <clears throat> for clarification on the grid market agreement. The MOU with grid market will be shared with the honorable members of parliament as requested. Um, the further question was in terms of how it was selected. There was a SDG platform that was the discussion, policy department, the department of BAC through uh, funds was able, so there was no funds from the government of St. Martin, so in terms of looking for opportunities uh, for the realization of this, via that SDG platform, the Department of BAC secured this um, relationship for government. Um, the process by which I will seek in writing and send to the members of parliament. The addendum that had been prepared in the expansion of the coalition um, has been shared at that time with the then sitting governor. Um, I saw some reports that it had mentioned that I said it was sent to the current governor. This was done back then with His Excellency uh, Governor Holliday. Um, and if it is necessary, I believe the chair of parliament as a member of parliament that it's not a government document, it's a parliament, uh, the members of parliament document, so the chair of parliament at his discretion will be able to share that. Are all the lines of the communication from and to the temporary management being done through the supervisory board of directors or is there a direct line of communication to Mr. Washington and back? As special representative, um, of course, if needed, we can call and ask a question, uh, but the direct lines of communication are with the supervisory board and similarly to us via the supervisory board. So the special representative facilitates the execution of the investigation, reports to the supervisory board and via the supervisory board. We always are in the copy of all those reports that go to the supervisory board and take any and all necessary operational actions in respect of GEBE's management to ensure that the going concerned is um, continue to be managed. The, super, the special representative also in consultation with the supervisory board of director assembled the crisis management team. The relationship between the representative and the supervisory board is governed by the statutory provisions on the relationship between the managing directors and the supervisory board. The crisis management team consists of persons from within and outside of NVGB and operates under the responsibility of the special rep. The management team, the crisis management team's primary task is to normalize, stabilize, and perpetrate normal production, delivery processes, and invoicing cycle of NVGEB. Not on the operational level, of course, but to ensure that that takes place. On the question from KPSM OM, the report from the public prosecutor uh, did it lead to any specific actions by the council? Once submitted and reviewed, this was discussed with, with in Council of Ministers and with the supervisory board. As a result thereof, uh, the crisis team management did take up contact and special representative did take up contact with uh, the OM to ensure that the open lines of communication would be maintained. Did the MP understand the Prime Minister to say that the integrity report is finalized or is this ongoing? 
If it is finalized, did COM receive the report and what actions did they recommend? The investigation process has recently commenced with requests towards LDGB for a list of information. GB has until January 10th to provide this information to the Integrity Chamber. As such, it is still an ongoing matter. COM was informed by both NVGBE as well as the Integrity Chamber that that process has started. There are no further actions required from the Council of Ministers at this time. So NVGB has until the 10th to provide the answers, after which the um, Integrity Chamber will then do its due diligence and report to us. When it comes to the shareholder rep, this is from MP Weaver. Weaver. Um, wanted clarity that the Council of Ministers is collectively still as the whole, the share her, shareholder representative of all government-owned companies. That is indeed still the case. I can confirm that that is the case. The Council of Ministers is the shareholder of all government-owned companies. The crisis team is effective. Comfort is being sought that the lines of the crisis team, special rep, and the rest of management. Is it an oversight that is being carried out? Indeed. The temporary manager is being supported by the crisis team, which has an oversight role, meets regularly with the management to ensure that the going concerns are addressed, offering guidance to management as needed and when needed also bringing in external assistance to assist to ensure that the administration is cleaned up. And as I mentioned before, the crisis team is also comprised of internal management members of NVGEB. Once the, after the hack, what can Parliament expect from the management? Um, once these final reports that are being awaited with all their recommendations are received, and of course the comprehensive strategy proposed, uh, Parliament will be updated accordingly, but of course the goal is to ensure that there is permanent management at NVGEBE. We also do not want the temporary situation to continue to be perpetrated, but thus far I must say that um, in preliminary discussions, one thing has been made certain is that strong management, uh, C-suite of strong candidates must indeed be priority to ensure that GB can continue to grow moving forward because the, in, the, the goal will be to continue to focus on going towards once we've cleaned up the current situation um, and even while we're doing that to focus on going towards renewable and sustainable energy production for St. Martin. <clears throat> the MP asked some clarification on the uptick in cash flow, what strategies um, for clarity have brought that has increased the revenues or the receivables. The strategy that the team came up with to increase collections focus on segmenting the client base and focusing on those which had prior payment arrangements to get those payments back on track. This has met with quite some success. They also ordered um, they put them in order, the others, from highest to lowest outstanding amounts and focus on securing down payments and continuance of continuation of payment arrangements with those that had the highest amount, the threshold had been identified, and so the focus was on that. So those were contacted to come in and make payment arrangements. Uh, November, therefore, saw the highest um, revenue generated um, for the year, even surpassing the amount that had been collected in February. So we look forward to those payment arrangements continuing and the focus continuing with the others as they go down the line. So that's the strategy that has been implemented, um, given a date and a timeline to come in or face the consequences, and they have been seeing some success with that. Mr. Chairman, those were the clarifications as have been uh, provided and any information that needs to be provided in writing will be done uh, um, by us. That is our purview will be provided by NVGB and government moving forward. I thank the members of parliament 
for the opportunity to update. We will continue to maintain the vigilance. As you know, um, the, another report is expected, as I mentioned on Friday, with the final reports from the auditing uh, committees that have been established by the end of the year. So hopefully in January, we'll be able to give a better picture once we have met as a council, as shareholder, with the supervisory board and management team on the way forward. Please, Mr. Chairman. Yes, a vraagpunt, as stated in our. It's just the it's just the Dutch translation uh, for yeah. basically a question, which yes. we are as you members know, entitled stand, to. Thank you. you. Would like to do that. Just making sure I have the yes. permission to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I needed to understand that this is my question. I need to understand the Prime Minister actually saying to Parliament that the document for the support of her government, which has been sent to the former governor, that the President of Parliament at his discretion is the one to share this document with Parliament. Mr. Chairman, the governor is not politically responsible. The government is to Parliament. The government shared a document, and I expect the government, not I expect, I am asking of the government, the Prime Minister, the Chairperson of the COM, to share that document with the members of Parliament, and not to be referred to the discretion of the Chair of Parliament. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Before going there, I want to clarify something that has come up many times. Yes, our rules of order has an interruption clause in it, uh, which is what you, you, let's say, say you would like to use. We all know that the guidelines for using this interruption has not been in place. What we do have is a clarification round where all members of parliament, after the, the questions have been received, have an opportunity to then still pose another question, okay? If we want to work out, as I've suggested many times in faction leaders meeting, a procedure and guidelines for interruption rounds and whether we want to get rid of the clarification round and do it as is done in other parliaments, we can do so. But if we're going to just start quoting that article and everybody can just get up and ask questions at, at any time, then that is not going to be in accordance with proper procedures as well. Uh, Prime Minister, you just say so, answer. Give your answer, Prime Minister, and then we can continue. I will allow the pr Prime Minister, if you want to reiterate your answer or respond, I'll allow a response at this point. And I will also elucidate on the point of, of coalition agreements being sent to Parliament, etc. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, the addendum to the coalition agreement, um, I don't know if the original coalition agreement was shared with Parliament. Uh, so if anything is to be shared, then the original plus the addendum would then be shared. Okay. As another note, I want to, I've taken a note and the former, well, the acting chairman at the time, vice chairman, has addressed this issue. And this question can continue to come up as many times. However, the last time that a coalition agreement or any sort of such agreement was sent, it was sent by the governor of, of St. Martin to the parliament of St. Martin on the 23rd of September, 2019. Another thing that we do not have clear within this parliament is our own parliamentary procedures for recognizing what is so-called opposition and what is so-called coalition. If the parliament of St. Martin would like to set that up and formalize such, well, let's have that discussion as well. Members of parliament, of course, free to ask questions at any time. The government then gives a response. My role is not to judge the quality of the response. My role is to simply ensure that you have received a response. The all members of parliament today and in all meetings have received responses. MP Westcott Williams, you again have received a response. So with that, members of parliament, I thank you for your participation in this meeting. I would like to thank the prime minister and minister of general affairs, as well as the support staff and Mr. Washington from GEBE for your participation in this meeting. And I hereby close this meeting. Meeting closed.